So there's a couple of folks who have to go. This is informal. You come and go as you please. This is not a class. Um, for those of you I don't know, I'm Rafael Lorente. I'm one of the associate deans. And this is the first time we've ever done this. I don't know how it's going to go, but I'm kind of excited that there's a full room here, and I'm hoping that next semester we'll have to use Eaton or something, because um, we'll have a lot more people. Um, the idea behind this is really simple from my perspective. Every one of you has to take a capstone course before you leave. Um, some of you know exactly what you want to do. Some of you, what I have found over the four or five semesters that I've been doing this, is that some of you wait till the very last second and then run, run to the advising office and try to figure out which capstone is still open and which one fits in your schedule. And I want you guys to avoid that. It's not that I'm saying this capstone is better or that one's better. It's that if you know what you want to do and you plan ahead, your experience will be that much better. All right? Um, so that's the idea behind this. And I hope you guys start thinking. You see the faculty members make presentations. You make connections between faces and classes. And you go find them. Go show up in their offices. If they're not there, leave a little note. You know, write on their glass door. No, don't do that. Um, leave them notes. Make appointments. So that you know what, um, so that they know who you are, and you can start talking to them. Not a single faculty member who teaches a capstone course is going to go. Don't bother me, freshman. Come back in three years. That's not going to happen. All right. So, and for your friends who aren't here, tell them. Right. These guys are. Every last one of them is going to go. Yeah, come on in. Let's talk. Okay. Um, so I want you guys to think think about what you want to do. The capstones are meant to be project teamwork courses where you produce some form of journalism for the real world, right? So this is our way of trying to take everything you learned, whether you learned it in a classroom or you learned it at the Diamondback or you learned it on an internship, and have you use it in a class as much as possible in a real world atmosphere. And not only will we send it out through CNS or some of it, but we'll promote it and we'll try and find ways to get it out there. All right, so um, just so you guys know, in addition to, so even if you're not in CNS, if your capstone produces something that CNS can put out, CNS will put it out. If CNS can't put it out, we'll try and find somebody else to do, right? And then there are a couple of other creative ways that people are getting stuff out. So the idea is to get you a real portfolio in some way, whatever that is, that, um, that works for you. Um, the faculty members who are here, thank you. Um, are going to come up here and they're going to do like a two or three minute, here's what my class does. If they take more than three minutes, I'm going to be gone. Because um, what I really want you guys to do is to go talk to them, right? They're going to sit here and answer questions and you can go to them and say, hey, I'm a broadcaster. Can I come take your non-broadcast course? Is that okay? Or I'm not a broadcaster. What do I do to get into that course? Or whatever, right? What I think you guys are going to find is that the capstones, with one or two exceptions, are a lot more flexible than you think. And that we really want you, how do I say this without encouraging you to break the law? Um, we really kind of want you to break some stuff, and I don't mean literal stuff. But we want you to think sort of outside the cliche box. We want you to come to our capstone instructors and say, hey, this is great the way you do this. What if we do this? Right? And we might say no 50 out of 51 times. That's okay. That's real, that's real life. But you might hit on that one idea, and you might have a really good conversation, and you might learn something, and they might learn something, and we might do something cool. Um, and that's really what, um, what we're aiming for. So I'm going to shut up. I am going to well, let one person go before you who has to leave. Please. Mark went up and set himself up. He was ready. So I was going to reward Mark by letting him go first. But Brooke has to go, so I'm gonna let Brooke go first. So Brooke Osher runs the Social Analytics Bureau for CNS. Um, Brooke is one of our master's graduates. She's working on her PhD. She did social media for Discovery. Um, and I'm not gonna introduce anybody, everybody else, so I guess I shouldn't have yes. introduced you. <laughs> Hi, like Brooke said, my name is Brooke. Um, I'm up at the Studio C. I run the Social Journalism and Audience Engagement Bureau for CNS. Um, we run the social platforms for CNS. We also create social stories. Um, we 
find stories using social media, anything you can think of with social media, social graphics, social video. Um, if that sort of stuff interests you, please come talk to me. I have to run out, but two of my students um, who are in the Bureau this semester are here, Kwame and Mark, and they'll be happy to tell you what we have going on. Also, come see me anytime in Studio C. I'm always here. I'm also a PhD student, like Rafael said, so I'm in the building a lot. So if you see me, just grab me and say, tell me that you're interested, even if you're just wondering what sort of jobs exist in the world for people interested in social media, please come talk to me. Cool. Thanks, guys. And we are accepting applications for CNS um, for fall 2017. So come see. Um, we got info over here. We'll talk to you about that. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. And I would try to pull up what they're doing, but I couldn't go fast enough because I just can't type that fast. But I'm trying to find Mark Kwani. You know what? Why don't I add lib while you're doing this? How many of you um, are seniors? Raise your hands. Okay. Juniors. All right. Sophomores. All right. Thinking ahead. Any first years? Ooh, a lot. All right. Good to you. How many of you are listening to broadcast? And how many of you are multi platforms? Okay. All right, well, that's helpful and good to know, and that's a TV ad lib. And here's, here's and the... Welcome to Tabletop Transfer. We'll give you updates on social trending topics of the week to discuss with your fellow humans on a casual Friday night out. As you can see, we've upgraded. Green screen. Let me see you, Neo. I'm self-aware. Are you? Time to talk weekend icebreakers. You ready, Kwani? Ready, Mark. Start the clock. Thursday marks the first day that NFL free agents like Tori Smith and Tony Romo are allowed to sign with different teams. Time to Romeo it up, Romo. Word of advice, blowing kisses works better than blowing out your back. FBI <laughs> <laughs> Director James Comey called President Trump's claims of Obama wiretapping incredulous. Many took to Twitter to voice their opinions, and then to Google to find out what that means. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, you get the idea, right? Uh, that's Brooks' crew. Yes. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Uh, investigative comedy is sometimes what that's been called. Because uh, with John uh, Oliver and others, sometimes you get more truth uh, there than you do uh, in some of the straighter formats. Okay, my name is Mark Feldstein. It's about to click on. Uh, I'm one of the broadcast professors here. Uh, and I teach what's called long form TV class. Um, for those of you who are broadcasters, that's a very um, vague term, but it basically means not your daily news story, not your minute and a half, two minute story, it's something that's longer. It can range anything generally from four to six minutes on a nightly newscast that's half an hour, um, or it can be a magazine length piece, eight to 12 minutes, multiple series, or documentaries. Um, I did them all, I had 20 years in TV, 10 in local stations, 10 at the networks, so CNN, ABC, and NBC, I did documentaries and, uh, and magazines, mostly law enforcement. So what I want to do is, and what I do in this long form class, is uh, we have you do two long form pieces that we want to be kick ass stories that are so good, you put them on your resume reel and you get hired afterwards. Um, and my students have gone on uh, you know, to do really well. I have a bunch of vice who do a lot of long form stuff around the world. Uh, one of my former students is an anchor at CNN. I'm not saying you take my class. I will happen to you, mind you. But you will, I will teach you how to do long form. And it's different. You're dealing with sort of a narrative arc. You build to a climax. Um, uh, you know, there's a resolution. If it's multi-parts, you find a way to keep your, your uh, viewer interested in watching through the commercial break. I'm going to play you a two-minute excerpt because I know Raphael's got his uh, eye on the clock. Uh, one of the things I did when I was at CNN, one of the, the long form pieces, um, and it'll just give you a sense of, and why is it? Uh, you know, kind of. Deadly consequences. In Brownsville, Texas, dozens of babies were born with a rare and often fatal birth defect between 1988 and 1992. The victims' families blame corporate polluters. They claim U.S. companies relocated across the border in Mexico in part to escape environmental controls required in the U.S. For the last five months, Impact has been investigating, uncovering new and disturbing information. Correspondent Mark Feldstein discovered a corporate double standard and a pattern of environmental abuse. Please be advised. 
The following report contains disturbing images. You might not want to be eating. In the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, just across the border from Mexico, newborn babies suffered gruesome deaths. Babies literally born without brains. There wasn't even a fourth of the brain there. It would look like somebody took a knife and just wiped the top of their head off. A terrifying epidemic from a rare birth defect called anencephaly. And then so the brains were on the outside. In all, more than 30 babies perished, most within a matter of months, all within just a few miles of Brownsville, Texas. At this hospital in 1991, three brainless babies were born in just 36 hours. One of them was Jenna Hermietis's daughter. I cry every time I think of her. Justine Guerrero was one of another 25 babies born with a related and devastating spinal tube birth defect called spina bifida. Without the help of the braces, she, she cannot walk. From the ankle down, she has no feeling whatsoever. The ghastly plague has never recurred, its cause never identified. But mothers in Brownsville blame the contamination along their border. There's a lot of pollution that comes from um, Mexico, and uh, I believe it started to affect the environment on our side. Nearly 100 U.S.-owned factories called maquiladoras, including many of America's blue-chip corporations, are just across the river in Matamoros, Mexico. Here, the labor has been cheap, the environmental restrictions virtually non-existent. All the maquiladoras deny cop. Okay, you get the idea. It doesn't have to be so grim. You know, we do profiles of entertainers and whatever. The idea is to come out with some kick ass TV that'll get your job. I'll shut up and we'll move on to the next person. But if you're interested in law reform TV, come talk to me and uh, I'll talk to you more about it. Thank you, Mark. So I don't have an agenda now. Who wants to volunteer? Okay. You guys feel free to ask questions now or just wait till afterward. Yeah, the lights on? Corner them. How are you doing, Bob? Good morning. Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Sean Musselman, and uh, I run the data journalism and um, uh, web development bureau for Capital News Service. So we are one of the four CNS bureaus. We work out of Studio C. And uh, I work with students who do things like build interactive graphics, who analyze data for, um, for the purpose of finding interesting stories, uh, and who do sort of advanced web development. So if you're interested um, in any of those three things, uh, capital news service, uh, uh, data journalism, and graphics, uh, please come talk to me. Uh, this is the CNS website, so we, we this is what we mainly produce. Uh, we publish a lot of work in conjunction with other capstones as well. So just as an example, uh, Sandy Beniski is going to talk here in a second. Uh, so this is a project some of the Capital News Service uh, data journalists and graphics reporters uh, did in conjunction with some of Sandy's students in the Baltimore Urban Affairs Reporting class, um, which Sandy will probably talk about this more in a minute, but sort of looking at the central question, why was it that, that people in Freddie Gray's neighborhood in Baltimore uh, had a life expectancy that was, in some cases, 10 to 15 years younger than people in Richard neighborhood? 20 years. 20 years, yeah. Um, so as part of this, we did a lot of the data journalism that's, that underpinned the project. Uh, and we produce things like this interactive map, which um, instead of using the life expectancy for each of these neighborhoods, we swapped out countries that were similar. So this was um, uh, Freddie Gray's neighborhood, if you guys are familiar with that story. Uh, life expectancy the same as North Korea, one of the most repressive dictatorships, whereas places like Roland Park in northern Baltimore, uh, same life expectancy as Japan. So. Um, we're training people to do these kinds of stories, which are uh, in very, these sort of skills in very high demand in a lot of, a lot of these organizations. 
anyway, that's us. I'll be over there with the rest of the CNS Bureau Directors. Come talk to me. And when he says Studio C, for those of you who don't know, it's down the hall on the left. Sure. Hi, right, well, I'm gonna, another part of Capital News Service. I'm Jim Carroll. I'm the Washington Bureau Chief for CNS, uh, as the name implies. We're in Washington, and uh, we work out of the Reagan Building um, four days a week. And uh, we have a rather broad mission, even though it's the DC Bureau, we cover. We do go up to the Hill. We've had people actually covering things at the White House, but we've also uh, had this semester already. We've had uh, what the Big Ten. We've covered. Uh, we covered obviously the inauguration. We covered the Women's March the day after that. Uh, so we've had a broad experience. Very very busy uh, semester, as you can imagine. Uh, and uh, Raphael was talking about flexibility before, and, and our approach at CNS, I, I think I can speak for everybody, is that um, you know we'd like you to come to us with ideas for stories that you want to pursue, and then um, you know it's where we're going to say no if it's a you know or we'll help you maybe uh, fill it out a little bit. But uh, we really want to see what you can do and what you bring to the to the table. Uh, so we encourage that. But uh, anyway, so DC has been, uh, we've had the, a bureau there for quite a long time, and uh, if you, I encourage you to look through the CNS site. Uh, you'll see some photo galleries there. We do have um, multi-platform, we have uh, photographers, we do have people from the broadcast bureau come down and work out of our bureau from time to time. So it's a, uh, and it's a very cooperative effort. A lot of the bureaus work together on uh, projects depending on what it is, so um, it's, a, it's a really, uh, Fantastic experience. You want a real world opportunity to um, mix it up with Mitch McConnell uh, or Donald Trump. I can't promise on Trump, but uh, in any case, uh, come see us. And they're located in the Reagan Building, which is the really giant building about half a block from the White House um, on Pennsylvania Avenue, next door to Trump Tower or Trump Hotel or whatever. Trump they Hotel. Call it. Trump Hotel is a block away. <laughs> I still haven't set foot in it yet. So. I'm here with the Bureau Chief in Annapolis for CNS. Um, I don't know if anyone's mentioned this yet, but really, what's really exciting that's happened in the last year is that the print stories that we move are being picked up by the Associated Press. So our our um, our multi-platform students' print stories are appearing everywhere. You know, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, LA Times, some international coverage. So that's really great as you move ahead in your career. I also would invite broadcast students to write um, text stories to accompany their packages. We move those, and those are also picked up. Um, I just wanted to let you know that for the for the spring semester, obviously we cover the legislature because that's what they're in. We cover the governor all year. We cover the decisions that the legislature makes all year. And in the fall, we tend to have more time for news features, long-form stories, investigative pieces. I'm just going to read you really quickly a couple of story subjects that we've covered in the last year or two. So we've had students go out of the bureau and cover this stuff. Falconry, which is hunting with the falcon. Um, we have an unusual influx of Burmese refugees in Maryland. Someone wrote a profile on a, the driver of a hearse. Um, remember that weird guy? Hearse driver. Prison in college. Someone went to prison and attended a college course there. We've covered the Pope. Been credentialed to cover the Pope. Um, stories about unclaimed property. Of course, the governor. A story about a tiny Amish school. Um, a story about what happens to a dead body when you die. Someone went to the morgue, took photos. That, that's, I think all of these I'm mentioning have been nominated for, um, or have won writing awards. Medical marijuana, that's a perennial subject. And someone did a ride along and a video, and still photos, with the Baltimore City Animal Catcher. All of these stories are, come out of regulation that the state puts out, or legislation. So the nut is, what is the state doing? And then we can do all these cool stories. If you can think of it, I'll send you there. So um, I, I really look forward to you guys applying. Think about it. Applying <coughs> isn't committing. So if you're on the fence, just apply now and then 
you know, take some time. You can talk to us more, but pay attention to the deadline. Okay, thanks. So oh, that, that story that they did out of Annapolis, you saw all I did was do a quick search, and there it is in the Miami Herald um, website. Right. We're trying to get them to move photos and video as well. Working on it. Yeah, yeah. working on photos, videos, and graphics. That's coming next. Oh, yes. My presentation is relatively short. I'll start with a few things. Give me an S. S. Give me a P. P. Give me an O. o. Give me an R. R. Give me a T. T. Give me an S. S. What's that spell? Sports. Louder? Sports. A little louder? Sports. Sports is not dead. Um, my name is Dave Owens. I teach journalism 368B. Sports reporting and MMJ, multimedia journalism, right down in 2109. So what we do is we prepare uh, young journalists for the world of sports reporting, but in a different way. Um, sports is changing. Everyone understands that now. Um, why are you smiling? Do I have something on my face? Can I go? It's you. What's that? Oh, is that me? <laughs> I hope that's you. <laughs> Um, sports is changing. Uh, we are, the, one of the things that we teach is the movement away from this, just the traditional standing behind a desk and saying, hi, I'm Dave Owens and welcome to the 5 o'clock sports. Uh, we try to go out and mesh the differences or the sort of the intermingling between a sports story and human interest, which is what a lot of uh, television stations and entities are looking for in this day and age. Uh, we provide all of the, or some of the, most of the uh, sports uh, anchoring for CNS. We also produce a show each semester called Terrapin Time Out where we talk about different uh, sports issues around the way. So we go to Maryland Sports. We produce live shots from out there or pseudo live shots from out there. Uh, when they leave my class, they are ready. They have a resume reel to go out and get a job. So sports is not dead. It's alive and well. Come to journal 368B. Thank you. I'll be right over here. Oh, no, I brought I brought the boys. I brought the boys. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. What's going on? My name is Josh. I teach my main class is Journalism 361, which is broadcast, uh, upper level broadcast. I just started recently a class we're calling Broadcast Innovation. Now, you don't absolutely have to be a broadcast student to take it. There are other things that we're doing that, you know, as like multi platform, if you're interested in motion graphics or stuff like that, and you want to incorporate that into video, that's stuff that we're looking into. Does anybody know what this is? Has anybody seen one of these? Yeah. What is it? It's a 360 camera, right? So we're doing stuff in 360. We are, do you guys know who Casey Neistat is? Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So we're trying to look at where the future of like that kind of stuff, like YouTube and like the really innovative different stuff that you guys are watching, where that intersects with news. Um, we just did actually, so RJ, I brought RJ up because he just put together this 360 video on oysters, which I actually have some goggles afterwards. I can show you guys how it really looks. But um, he went out on an oyster barge with the 360 camera. This was featured in the museum. The museum picked it up as one of their top 10 VR videos of the month. So, RJ, what was that like going to the museum and seeing it there? Um, it was great. Uh, and I wouldn't have had that chance without taking this class. Um, to go out and shoot with one of these, you really need to find like, an awesome story which is what I did with Josh's help. So for weeks we threw around where we shoot, like what would be the best location. Because in 360 you can't just sit in a room and like interview someone because you, you need to make sure every angle is of interest, uh, which is what we found in this story. Um, so with Josh's help and the rest of the class's help, uh, in a few weeks we came up with the story idea, went out and shot it, and uh, Josh and I and everyone else in the class kind of helped uh, pitch in. I was in a group of four, and, um, and it really, turned out to be a great success and, it's, and it'll be great for me personally too. Yeah, so we also, um, you know, we get to play around with all different kinds of toys. This is a documentary camera. It is a DSLR uh, camcorder hybrid. 
this thing shoots and it looks like a DSLR and it, it's got all the bells and whistles of a camcorder too. And we're also doing, we do a weekly vlog. I don't know if you guys have seen our new spin vlog, which is kind of like a behind the scenes of what's going on in our class and other classes around, um, around campus. So here's, I'll show you a couple minutes, just a minute of one of our, our vlogs. It's muted. Growth of the oyster bar industry in the, in the region. Um, so you may have seen this during Giving Day. We're, we're trying to take the stuff that Casey Neistat does and actually add some substance to it, you know, instead of just like... ...a 24 hour period where we challenge alumni, faculty and staff from Maryland to basically donate their money for students and student scholarships at Maryland. So in my class, what I'm trying to have you guys do is kind of like, like what Raphael said, we want to break the mold, right? Like, you've been pounded, no jump cuts, no jump cuts, no jump cuts. But we're trying to find innovative different ways to use jump cuts, right? We're trying to figure out like, where does music fit in into journals and videos? Because traditionally, you don't use music. But now, more and more, like if you, if you go on sites like Vox or you know stuff like that, you see a lot more music, right? So we're trying to figure out how to do that and how to do it ethically and where the music really fits in to what we do. So that's pretty much it. If anybody has any questions, we'll be over there. Come try out the, uh, the virtual reality. Also, also last week, um, a friend came in the museum after going to see the video. Came in, brought almost three thousand dollars worth of uh, equipment in, and we got to walk off the side of the skyscraper and do HTC Live really cool. yeah. and experience some awesome virtual reality stuff. That I'm gonna be doing the class, yeah, so. we actually went to the museum. Hopefully, we were hoping to see our video, but they took us on like a backstage tour to show us all the all the VR stuff that they're doing. So, and, and when they say their video was at the museum. So the museum does the top 10 360 videos of the month. So their video was in a museum exhibit along with videos from the New York Times, the Associated Press, I think it was BBC. Netflix. Yeah, Netflix. It was nine professional yeah. news organizations and Merrill College. RJ's video got picked up by the Capitol in Annapolis. It got picked up by the Baltimore Sun and the LA Times too. All right, thank you. So, um, this is Dana's class. So, Dana Priest is uh, en route to uh, meet with Vladimir Putin. So, um, some of our students are going to talk about the uh, press freedom class. Well, she didn't run away to Russia, I just didn't tell her so little. She's shy. All right, yeah, so we're here to represent Dana Priest's Press Freedom Reporting class. Uh, and it's a really good option if you're interested in doing reporting on an international level. Um, everyone is assigned an imprisoned journalist somewhere in the world. This is Khadija Duman, and she is an imprisoned journalist in Turkey. Uh, she's still in prison. She's been there since 2003, so it's been a really long time. Um, this is uh, Sergey Resnick. He was the reporter that I profiled, and my story ended up on CNN. Um, it was a really interesting experience to learn about press freedom in Russia. It got more interesting this year, but um, it was cool then too. I, I got to talk to him on like a secret prison cell phone um, while he was in a Russian prison. And these just aren't really experiences that you you know have in any other class. So it was really interesting. And of course, like the opportunity to learn under Dana Priest is such an incredible one. And if she's your like you have the opportunity to have her as a professor, you should do it because she's like the coolest person. She's going to prizes my life. and she's just an inspiration. Hey, that hurts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Isn't she the coolest person you've met? <laughs> if you don't know who she is, she's a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter from the Washington Post who wrote about the Trade Medical Center and uh, the CIA secret black site prisons abroad and just has a great advice about life and journalism so you should take a class with her and also i wrote so my story i profiled mustafa azizi here but um i ended up he was imprisoned in evan prison which was the same prison jason Rezaion, um was a prison in, and then when jason was released and the other hostages they weren't really talking about what happened in evan prison but for dana's class i had figured out what the conditions were like because something you learn is that you talk to like former prisoners to figure out the conditions. Um, and I ended up pitching the story to McClatchy and then they published it and different publications picked it up. So you can get published in CMS, other 
outlets, good opportunities for that. I use it as a clip. Yeah, so in general, um, Dana really teaches you how to kind of push yourself and talk to people that you normally would never talk to. I'm currently researching and reporting on an in-prison journalist in Russia. So I'm planning on going to the embassy. I've already talked to the State Department. I'm reaching out to many exiled Russian journalists. And as you can tell, it's a very hot topic right now. Um, so in general, if you're really interested in foreign correspondents or just um, long-form investigative reporting, Dana Priest is the way to go. Yeah, and I would just say, like, when, I, when I, I'm in the class now and I'm reporting on a journalist uh, in Egypt, um, and when I first got into the class, I was, like, really intimidated. And I looked at my classmates, and I looked at Dana, and I, figured out what I was supposed to do in the class, and I was like, holy crap, I'm never going to be able to do this. I have trouble contacting the director of Stamp Fest for an article. <laughs> 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 um, I'm back. Um, and then, you know, it's really like, you got to get guided through it, and it ended up being really easy. And now I joke that, like, the second most person that I text in my phone is my journalist's son, who, like, like literally, he'll just send me updates, like, that, day after day, and we'll like have like late night conversations. And it's really great, it's a really great friendship that I've developed. But no, it's a, it's a, it's a really great class, and it's really accessible. Um, and also, you just do stuff that you would never in a million years think you're going to do. So. And last pitch, um, we're also turning it to kind of a publication. Um, and so we're working on a podcast right now, and we've had students do videos. So if you are broadcast, there are lots of spots for you as well. And I also just wanted to mention behind us is the website for Press Uncuff, which is a press freedom advocacy organization uh, that's kind of based out of this class. So if you don't end up taking this capstone, but you're still interested in getting involved with press freedom, uh, we have this website that we've been working on for a while, and the stories that students write in the capstone are being published on this website. Um, so that's another way to get a clip out. Uh, and we also um, participate in different events around each um, pertaining to press freedom, and we sell cool bracelets with the names of imprisoned journalists. So, if you're interested in getting involved with that, you should talk to Naomi and I. We are very involved with press Thank you. Thank you. especially news, had fewer reporters than they had in the past. Um, everyone knows that. But there's a major exception. There's one area that's growing. Do you guys know what it is? Business. Business. Business economics, and that's what I teach, business and economics. I spent 30 years as a reporter and editor at the Wall Street Journal, which I loved. And now I'm teaching about those same things. There is a reason why more people are reading business and economics. There's a reason. And then the demand for that type of coverage has been growing and growing and growing. And it's because there's this angst that people feel, not just in this country, but around the world, about their standing in the world. Where do we as Americans stand in the world? Is our standard of living really falling, or does it just seem that way? What about income inequality? What's causing that? Why the rich appear to be getting richer, the poor are getting to be poor, and the middle class is like scrambling? What about infrastructure? Why can't we have better roads? Why can't we have better facilities? A lot of people are wondering about those things. People are wondering about their retirement. What's going to happen? Is there going to be money for me to have a safe and healthy retirement? So when you write about business and economics, those are the sum of the issues you write about. You write about people at the top, you write about people at the bottom. And you write about American policy and what politicians can do to correct some of these problems that appear to be affecting our economy. You have to, if you look at the last election, business, economics were some of the major themes that were discussed, right? Immigration, inequality, um, taxation. Who should pay taxes? Should middle class taxes go up? Should poor people pay more? Should rich people pay more? Anyway, these are the subjects that we deal with in business and economics. And like I said, that's where the jobs are. So hope you guys can take my slides. Before you guys think that this business stuff is boring, this was the business class last year did a project on nursing homes and people being kicked out of nursing homes when they couldn't pay or when Medicare was no longer paying for them. 
and I don't know if I can Google this fast enough, but if you Google the name of the nursing home and the Washington Post, you will find that the Attorney General of Maryland sued one of the nursing home companies after reading our project. So this had an actual impact on, um, on real people within months of publication, maybe less. So, Bethany? I'm having a student do that. Oh! Okay, she's going to come. So you're fine. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Hannah. I'm a senior broadcaster and a major. I was part of the Viewfinder team last semester and I'm also doing a lot of work with them this semester. Um, so what is Viewfinder? It's an advanced video storytelling class. We focus on creating visually engaging natural sound packages and videos. Um, what makes a good applicant for Viewfinder? So a lot of people think it's just broadcast. Um, it can be both broadcast students and multi-platform students. Um, and it's great, a lot of you guys are underclassmen, so you have time to work out your schedule. If you can take the photojournalism class, that would be great because um, it helps you learn a lot about the DSLR cameras, which is what we use. Um, and the most, the better you know the cameras before you get into the class, the better it will be when you get there. Um, and also, try not to take it, this really goes along with a lot of the capstones, um, try not to take it the same semester as an internship. Um, take an internship every other semester, but this class requires a lot of work, um, so we kind of consider it an internship. If you don't know, uh, Bethany's back there. She is our fearless leader. <laughs> uh, Bethany worked at CNN for a lot of years and joined Merrill back in 2012 and created Viewfinder. Um, we are actually in TAWS. Um, we call her Rim Swain Domain, TAWS 022B. <laughs> um, we're there all day, Monday and Wednesday, like from 10 a.m. to 6 or 7 p.m. So if you guys want to stop by, um, feel free. We'd love to say hi. Uh, something interesting about Viewfinder, um, you get badges instead of grades. So the class, as it's a capstone and it's mostly upperclassmen who take it, um, we focus a lot on what you can get out of it for the real world. So networking, volunteering, um, external learning, making business cards, stuff like that. Um, so these are just some of the badges that you can get. Uh, the equipment, instead of broadcast style cameras, we use DSLR cameras. Um, the Nikon D7100, we use a wireless mic, tripod, um, and a shotgun mic. So it's not much equipment, um, but it's really high quality and something that's super cool is you get it at the beginning of the semester, you get to keep it until the last day of the semester. Um, so you don't have to worry about going back to the uh, equipment desk. And you guys use it for inside the class and outside of the class work. Um, Viewfinder also focuses a lot on leadership. So while we are doing journalism and making videos, um, you can help learn real world experience with leadership, whether it's producing or writing a show, help setting up the final screening, working on social media for Viewfinder. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in that realm. We also focus a lot um, on teamwork. So it's a pretty small class, seven, eight, nine people. Um, and what's also really cool is the view, we call the Viewfinder alum. They are really passionate about helping current um, Viewfinder students. So we always have coaches come back. So all Viewfinder students come back and help the current students um, at the beginning of each semester to help them um, with any tips and advice that they have. And we do a lot of teamwork with videos. We also collaborate with PALS um, and CNS. We're doing a lot of that more this semester. And networking, Bethany has been great getting us in touch with uh, professionals in the business. So most recently we went to the NBPA Northern Shore course in Virginia where we got to meet some of the best in the business. Um, MMJs, photojournalists, everything like that. Um, and they sat down with us, took the time out of their day, and critiqued our work, which was amazing. Um, and they are encouraging us to keep in contact with them after the event. Um, so networking has been great. We always take a field trip every semester. It's fun. It's a great event. Bond. Um, we've been to NPR, NBC, or some place in NBC. Um, and something important to think about for Viewfinder is it's not a one-size-fits-all class. You can come into it, and it's really what you want to get out of it is what you will get out of it. So if you really just want to focus on your video skills, that's that's fine. That's what you can do. If you really want to be a producer, 
that's fine. You can focus on producing all of our shows for the semester. Or if you want to be on camera, you can anchor our shows. Um, and every semester is different. Like last semester, we only did two shows for the whole semester uh, because we did a lot of extensive reporting. Where in the past, it's been we've done four shows in a semester. Um, and this semester, we focused on doing like silent stories. So we're always kind of innovating. Um, every semester is a little bit different. So you really get into it what you really get out of it, what you put into it. Um, we like to use fun stuff, uh, not as cool as Josh's class, but we like, we've used the 360 video GoPros, and most recently Snapchat Spectacles, really cool. And last but not least, we make some cool friends, and wherever Bethany is, there is food. So if you have any questions, um, we've got a lot of viewfinder people. Um, we'd love to talk to you guys. Here, a faculty member to Sandy. Um, and then I'm going to represent a couple of people who aren't here. Okay. So, um, Sam Kulinski, I'm with uh, T4 for Urban Affairs. John is here, Talia is here. Who else is here from the class? Um, so, we meet on Mondays in Baltimore in the offices of the Baltimore Sun. Not so bad if uh, somebody tends to notice you there. Um, uh, we spend a semester working on a multi platform project on one topic. So these guys are still editing um, because we, uh, we're working in conjunction with Kaiser Health News in Washington. They're the ones who've slowed us down. We're ready to go. <laughs> um, but I want to, uh, we spent the semester working on how your house can make you sick with a focus on asthma. So John, the highlight of your uh, semester in Baltimore, don't say the Halloween lunch at the bar in Falls Point. <laughs> so, um, I would say the highlight was, yeah, it's hard to pick one in particular, but um, really okay. sort of, it, this is almost like a boot camp for just on the ground uh, recording skills, knocking on doors, getting comfortable talking to people. Having doors slammed in your face. Having doors slammed in your face, having mm -hmm. people be rude to you, but just being relentless, and that's something that I think that I definitely pulled from this class, is sort of the persistence uh, that it takes to be sort of on the ground being recorded. Talia? Yeah, just being able to get to know people. Um, because our class is in Baltimore every week, we're not stuck here in College Park just making phone calls. They really do emphasize, you know, true leather reporting. Um, uh, Professor Beniski would send us all into a neighborhood, and we'd just go knock on doors. You'd see everyone on the other side of you just asking people, like, hey, do you have asthma? And sometimes they'd let you in. And, that was cool. um, and so just getting to know the, the people that your journalism is affecting instead of just kind of looking at it from far away. So we did indeed uh, speak to public health experts at Johns Hopkins. We, you know, we talked some semesters to elected officials. We talked to uh, community leaders. But we also talked to people who've never talked to um, a, a reporter before. If you take this class, as you learn to figure out the landscape of Baltimore, that's a transferable skill that you can use in any city you end up in. So. Um, 30 seconds, um, one of the most glamorous assignments, uh, 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 Kwani and Mark um, uh, took a stroll down through some trashy alleys because the public health experts at Hopkins told us uh, the alleys can uh, kind of um, set the stage for how healthy your house is and then how healthy you are. So. Hold on. In your backyard, in your alley, you're going to get rats. You're going to get mice. You're going to get roaches, which are outside. But trash is definitely connected. And trash is not always a um, individual behavioral thing. It's a neighborhood thing. And that goes way deeper than just, um, you know, behavioral issues and stuff like that. That goes into like some of the social determinants of health and being able to, you know, have pride in your neighborhood. So that was one of our more fun afternoons, seriously, right? Um, walking through alleys and trying to figure out um, uh, where the trash came from. Didn't come from this neighborhood. It's a poor neighborhood. And what the residents found out was people from other neighborhoods felt free to drive into this neighborhood and dump trash. A lot of tenants, not a lot of homeowners. People felt rather powerless. And if you have trash, you're going to have mice, you're going to have asthma. Um, uh, anything else you guys want to talk about this semester? 
Um, I think what I got out of this the most was you got to speak with some professionals who are in the housing departments.